So, um, Unix turned 50 this summer, and it almost uh, slipped my attention uh, until I read an article in the fall about it, and then I thought, well, we can't let the year end without having done something about it. So here we are. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the history of the last five decades of uh, Unix. And um, I've worked with Unix for uh, 40 of those years. So um, this is also going to be a personal history of my experience with uh, Unix. Um, and it's also uh, the history of this group in a couple ways, because you're all here, obviously, because you're interested in Unix in some capacity. Um, and also, uh, the group has been around for a number of those years. So I'm, I'm weaving those three threads into this one story. So, yeah, <laughs> you stole the thunder from my meme. But yeah, as I said, we're all here because we use Unix or we know about Unix. So um, here we are. Uh, so a few of you have shared your, your experience. I, I just uh, was wondering, you know, what Unix means to, to each of you, if, if a few of you could just shout out in your um, mind, what are the characteristics that make Unix Unix? So just, you know, adjectives or features in the system. Pipes. 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 Okay. <laughs> Anything Linux else? Linux but not. Yeah. As a young person, Linux but not. Linux but not. <laughs> I, I'd say like uh, elegance through simplicity is kind of what comes to my mind. Okay. Do one thing and do it well. Do one thing, do it well. Okay. The shell. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Something you developed like 30 years ago still works perfectly fine. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a big maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 All right. Anything else? Okay. Everything okay. is a text file. Everything is a text file. Text file. Come on. Uh, <laughs> for, for these definitions of character file, device file. <laughs> To an extent, both. I think Mac is a Unix. Yep. Certified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. One of the few remaining certified Unixes, actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So, yeah, uh, we all have our, our ideas of what Unix is about and why we like Unix. Uh, I'm going to take you back now 50 years and look at the start of it. And a lot of the things people have said, surprisingly, <laughs> um, are things that probably have been true right from the beginning, except for the first thing that was said by more than one pipes, person, pipes. <laughs> pipes. <laughs> that didn't come in until a few years later, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, so, uh, how it all started was uh, um, rather... Um, underhanded in a way, and just very below the radar. Uh, what happened is um, uh, Bell Labs, uh, AT&T Bell Labs, were part of a project involving two other organizations, one being MIT, who were the ones who actually spearheaded the project, and General Electric, who at the time were selling mainframe class computers. Um, so those were the other two partners, and uh, MIT had uh, been working on an operating system project and decided we're going to make our second system much better. <laughs> and some of you who've been in the industry long enough know about the second system syndrome, right? Okay, the idea is when you make your first system, you realize all the things it's lacking. And the second system you design in such a way that it will um, overcome all of those shortcomings of the first system. And it's a classic mistake for second systems. People get overly ambitious. And that is exactly what happened with Multics. So it ended up being way more complicated, way too ambitious for the hardware and the software technology of the time. And so um, Bell Labs decided at... Uh, uh, one point, they were the first to pull out of, of it. They said, this is costing us way too much money. We don't see um, any benefits in it for us. So they pulled out of the project. And uh, not too long after that, it kind of fizzled out. I think MIT continued to... Actually, 
Yeah, they did, they did get a system of sorts developed. And I think it was mostly MIT that was kind of letting it hobble along for a while and it eventually kind of faded into obscurity. Um, but yeah, Bell Labs pulled out first. Ken Thompson was one of the people who had been working on that project. And um, suddenly he found himself with some free time. And um, the uh, philosophy at Bell Labs was basically just work with anything, just work collaboratively with other researchers uh, in your area. But uh, when they came back from the Multix project, there was an extra little caveat there. They were, they were told, work on anything you want except operating systems. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Thompson took that as a challenge, of course. So he had to figure out a way that he could work on operating systems without working on operating systems. Um, so, of course, he couldn't really ask for a machine or anything like that because he couldn't get the attention of any higher-ups. He found uh, a, a little used or completely unused PDP-7 computer um, from a project that had been uh, since abandoned. And so he worked on that and basically just coded a bunch of stuff in assembler and the way he tells the story. Uh, after working on several utilities, he realized he was about three weeks away from a full operating system. <laughs> and conveniently, his wife was uh, going on a three-week vacation around that time with their child. And so he found himself with lots of free time and he basically hacked away day and night on this and came up with uh, a system that had no name at the start. And eventually, uh, Brian Kernahan, um, I've heard both Kernigan and Kernahan. Uh, I'm going to go with the uh, Wikipedia pronunciation, which is Kernahan. Um, uh, so there's actually two stories of the etymology of the name. I'm going to go with uh, Kernahan's version, which is that he named it uh, Unix. And it was, a, of course, a play on Multics, which stood for multi, Multiplexed Information and Computing System. And so he came up with Unix, spelt the way it is there, uh, as, as a play on Multics. And of course the idea was it was kind of a, a castrated uh, Multics system. So a much more simplified, less ambitious uh, version. Um, so this is what the hardware kind of looked like. This is maybe not exactly the system they were working on. Um, Though someone did actually go through the trouble of trying to figure out, based on a list of serial numbers and system descriptions from uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, because there were only a small number of these PDPs sold and an even smaller number that had been sold to Bell Labs. And so uh, someone figured out the actual serial number of the system they believe was the first one to run uh, Unix. And uh, so the, the, the red print uh, shows the characteristics that were unique to that configuration. So it happened to have 8K words of memory. Uh, 4K of that were used for the kernel and 4K were available for programs. So of course everything was written in assembler back then. You didn't really have a lot of room for more than that. Um, oh yeah, and this was one of the few PDP-7s that actually had a disk drive. And there's uh, on YouTube a video interview um, of Ken Thompson by Brian Kernahan where he describes the disk drive for this thing. <laughs> and it's quite interesting to hear him describe it. Um, so, yeah, basically not much to that computer. So soon afterward, they realized they need more of a computer. Uh, so Ken Thompson uh, put together a funding proposal, which he thought was a modest one by Bell Labs standards, um, for a PDP-10 computer, uh, which is what he was hoping to get. So he had actually a group of researchers and they had uh, an excuse for, for uh, the system, which wasn't operating system <laughs> development. And uh, they put uh, that funding proposal through and it was rejected. I guess they saw through his <laughs> subterfuge. So then they, uh, they had to try and figure out an alternate strategy. Uh, Joe Osana, who was one of the, the people at the labs who uh, was interested in text processing, came up with the perfect excuse for 
another funding proposal, which was they were writing a lot of patents at the time, and the formatting requirements for patents were very uh, specific, and there wasn't any software that did exactly that. And um, the labs actually had uh, an RFP out for some third-party company to develop exactly that. And it was going to be a very expensive project. So they put together a counter-proposal for uh, the purchase of a PDP-11 system, much more humble than the PDP-10 uh, configuration that had already been rejected. And uh, so this was not going to be for OS development, it was going to be for doing text processing software for patent applications. Um, but of course, uh, Ken was able to then use that computer in the evenings to continue with his pet project. So the first four, four versions were still just written in assembler. I'm surprised in the list of uh, characteristics people gave at the beginning, no one mentioned portability or high-level languages. Um, portability didn't come about until much later, um, towards the end of the decade, actually. And um, the use of a high-level language came in only uh, in 1973. And that was a rewrite of version 4. So they had already done several versions in Assembler prior to that. Um, and uh, what else was I going to say? Yeah, those first four versions were strictly internal to uh, Bell Labs. Uh, by the time they had version 5 out, they started to license it for educational institutions. And by the time version 6 was out, um, oh yeah, uh, sorry, for version 5, the number of educational licenses they sold, I think, was in the double digits. It was pretty small. Um, and uh, by ver the time version 6 was out, uh, many more universities had caught wind of this and were interested in it. And um, one of the other things that came about with version 6 is um, a computer science uh, professor in Australia named John Lyons um, studied the kernel uh, source code in, uh, intensively and decided it was the perfect subject for his operating systems course. So he um, printed off a line numbered listing of the entire kernel source and a companion commentary that referenced all of the code. And that one was originally available only to actual licensees. Uh, so you had to produce your uh, at and uh, uh, Unix license before you could get a copy of the commentary. But of course, this then started to uh, get uh, photocopied extensively uh, and covertly. And so th that's kind of illustrated in an homage <laughs> cartoon on the cover. So I'm just going to pass this around for people that might be interested in browsing the source code, which is now um, actually freely available uh, thanks to um, uh, the SCO group, I guess, who are the current... Uh, yeah, universal slash, Nobel slash, SCO group. So. Yeah, Caldera slash, yeah. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so by version 6, uh, much more extensively used uh, uh, at educational sites, and it was the first version where they actually released it commercially. Um, but they had to do so very carefully um, because um, AT&T was kind of in this strange monopoly position and because of that they were not allowed to compete in certain areas, which included competing against computer hardware and software companies. And so they made these licenses available at a very high price, but they did manage to find a few uh, commercial takers on that. Rand Corporation, I think, was the first commercial license they sold. And um, as I said, it's only by the end of the decade that they actually started to focus on portability. The use of the high-level language initially, it had been kind of a desire right from the very beginning because that was their ex experience with working on Multics, was developing the code in a high-level language. And so the idea of using a high-level language initially was just to, to make the code more readable and much more maintainable. Portability kind of came about as a, 
an incidental benefit, uh, but did take a considerable rewrite between v6 and v7. <clears throat> so just a little bit of an idea of what the, the PDP architecture looks like. Um, it was considerably more powerful than the PDP-7 before that, but it was still a fairly um, humble architecture compared to mainframe architectures. So 16-bit word length. Uh, but the PDP was a very nice um, uh, machine to work with. Uh, if anyone's interested, they can browse the processor handbook at the break. That's drawn as a door prize. Um, very simple orthogonal instruction set with um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, different addressing modes that were available for all of the instructions. And um, so it, it was really a, a simple, elegant architecture that way. I.O. was all memory mapped, so again, it made things very simple. You didn't need special instructions for I.O., you just accessed particular memory addresses. Um, I'm not sure if it was one of the first, but it was an unusual feature at the time, so, yeah. Um, and even at the hardware level, they did all, all kinds of things to make the architecture simple and orthogonal. So they had this um, unibus that was used for all uh, access between the processor and the peripherals and memory and all of that. So again, made things very simple, but it ended up being a bottleneck in terms of performance. Um, and also the 16-bit word length meant address restrictions. Uh, you were limited to um, 64K bytes because it was a byte addressable architecture, which was also unusual for the time. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so kind of limited in terms of how much uh, memory you could address. With a memory management unit, there was a trick you could use to extend your address range a little bit. Um, but those shortcomings in the architecture um, are what led to the development of the VAX, which was a way to address some of those shortcomings. But a very, very popular architecture for the decade. And just to give you an idea of the level of integration, here's an actual board from a PDP 1145 we had at the university. This is now one of our museum relics. Um, so what you'll see on this uh, particular board are some resistors, transistors, diodes, and a few chips in the 7400 series TTL. So if anyone's familiar with old electronics, that gives you the uh, idea of the level of integration. So TTL, this is before MOS and CMOS, um, higher power card? needs and very low level integration. So sorry. What is the card? Beats me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just going to circulate this for anyone who is interested. And note, note the, the purple color of the plastic tab on there, which color coordinates with the color scheme of the PDP-11 series. <laughs> so, um, putting our focus back on Unix again. Um, Mug has had a RTFM feature for the longest time. Well, RTFMing has been a feature of Unix right from the beginning. But of course, before there was man minus K, it wasn't easy to uh, look up a particular uh, command. So the printed manual came with something called a permuted index, which is basically just the name section of all the man pages uh, permuted according to uh, major keywords and sorted accordingly. And so you would then basically look for the keyword you wanted uh, and, and find your, your man page that way. These uh, pages, by the way, are from um, a scanned uh, version 5 manual that's available online at the um, Unix Historical Society website. Uh, and I've got links to all of this, and this presentation is going to be on the MUG website. Um, so yeah, here's just a typical command man page, but as you can see from the scribbles on there, people have always struggled with octal modes for files. <laughs> um, the other thing you'll notice is commands were very simple at the time. 
A lot of commands didn't even have options, and when they did, it was just a very small number of options. Man pages also tended to be typically just one page long, unless it was a fairly complicated command. And the other thing uh, I wanted to point out about commands is unusual for the time was the bugs section, but uh, they figured if we're going to write about this, let's just be honest. <laughs> and so they would point out bugs. And it was also a way of sometimes pointing out esoteric stuff and inside jokes and whatever. So yeah, this one's particularly funny. The name DSW is a carryover from the ancient past. Its etymology is amusing. But of course, they don't explain it anywhere else in the manual. <laughs> but if you browse enough, you might find a hint as to what the etymology might have been about. <laughs> This is a system call uh, in the version 5 mm -hmm. kernel. And the other thing I wanted to point out a bit about this man page is in addition to the C language binding uh, for the API, which would have been new at the time, um, they still had assembler bindings. And the version 6 manual also still had the assembler bindings. It was only by version 7 that they eliminated those because portability. <laughs> <clears throat> the other thing you'll notice if you uh, look comparatively at the, uh, um, the numbers of man pages in the various sections for a few typical versions that it was able to find mm -hmm. through the uh, Unix, uh, uh, Unix uh, Historical Society website, um, is the number of uh, system calls didn't increase drastically from version to version they were really very careful about what they added to the system. They were also um, interested in removing things as much as they were in adding things and uh, trying to keep things simple and small. And someone, or a few of you, pointed that out as one of the features, keeping everything simple and small. Um, so yeah, system calls didn't change drastically. Commands expanded a little more, but still then there wasn't all that much uh, increase. In fact, from version 5 to version 6, you can see um, 81 commands in section 1 for both. It looks like a big jump when it goes to version 7, but that's because they actually regrouped um, stuff from section 8 into section 1. There was a 1M subsection for all the maintenance commands. So if it was a command that was meant to be run interactively, it was moved to section 1, and stuff that stayed in section 8 was just things like boot procedures and particular demons and things like that, that you were never really meant to run interactively. Okay. Yep. The card that we're passing around mm -hmm. uh, actually originated in the PDP-8 era. Oh, really? We used across architectures all the way through the PDP-11. And despite the PCB saying flip chip, Mm -hmm. which I think just refers to the fact that you could theoretically mount it in either orientation. Oh, really? It's a one-shot <laughs> delay module. Uh -huh. So you need to delay a signal mm -hmm. for a few nanoseconds, microseconds, whatever. You simply would route it to this module yep. and pick up the output of the module again a few clock okay. seconds later. Yeah, so this may have been part of the clock circuitry because typically they had to generate a whole bunch of different clock signals in different phases and things like that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. So the other thing that happened in the 70s uh, is uh, as interest outside of uh, Bell Labs uh, would grow, um, people decided we need to get together with other Unix aficionados. And so the Unix user group was formed, and that's what it was called initially, the Unix user group, until AT&T started to flex its legal muscle and says, no, you can't use the name Unix because it's a trademark. And so they then changed their name to Usenix. Um, and uh, let's see, they published uh, back then, and still publish to this date, um, a magazine called Login, or semicolon login colon for us geeks. Um, there's an interesting bit of trivia about why the semicolon, but I'll leave that for later. <laughs> um, so yeah, they still have uh, several annual conferences. The group is still uh, huge and, and uh, a viable concern. Uh, 
Initially, and still to this day, it's got primarily an academic focus. If you look through their journals, you see papers like you would see in an academic journal. Uh, it's, it's very research focused. The other thing that happened, of course, was uh, uh, interest in different uh, academic circles uh, and access to the source code led to a lot of um, um, creativity and development from outside the labs. And so uh, Berkeley was one of the first university, not the first, but one of the first to get a license. And um, there was a group of Unix users there that were very prolific. And they started to um, release distribution tapes because that's the way uh, software was distributed before everyone had the interwebs. And so um, they uh, made their first uh, software distribution tape available in uh, 1978. And it was based on Unix version 6, although some of their development had happened earlier under version 5. But 1BSD was based on uh, Unix version 6. And at the time, it was really just add-ons to the system. I can't remember if 1BSD had patches to the kernel or whether it was all just um, yes. commands. Yes? OK. A couple of small ones. Because. All right. And by 2BSD, of course, there was more uh, kernel development that was going on. And by 3BSD, of course, there was a lot more kernel development that was going on. In fact, there was a significant rewrite of the AT&T Unix 32V kernel, which was the first um, Unix system to run on the VAX, but it was kind of a hastily done port and didn't include VM support. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Berkeley looked at that and said, what? It's for the VAX. It's got to have VM support. So, uh, so they wrote it. Oh, yeah, sorry. That is virtual memory, not virtual machine support. <laughs> so that's uh, the first decade. Now moving on to the second decade, we see a shift now from uh, more of an academic interest to more of a commercial interest. A few things happened there uh, to, to change things. One of the significant changes was the antitrust case, cases against um, AT&T that led to the breakup of AT&T into the baby bells and all of that. Um, but that allowed um, one of the remaining groups uh, to, uh, to uh, be able to exploit uh, uh, licensing Unix commercially to a much greater extent than they were, they were able to before. There was also um, some consolidation that happened within the labs. Um, they had one stream of Unix that they called internally research Unix, which were the versions V1 through V7, and then later on uh, V8, V9, V10, which led to Plan 9. A lot of those were just internal. They were never released. But within um, Bell Labs, there was also other groups that had taken uh, versions starting with version 4 and version 5 and on to version 7 and had put them to uh, practical uses and had done a lot of development work on the system themselves. One of the more notable ones was PWB Unix, which was the um, programmer's workbench Unix, which is where we got make and uh, source code control system and things like that added to, uh, to uh, V7 Unix. So at, uh, in the early 80s, as uh, AT&T was looking to develop this commercially, they decided we need to somehow merge these different versions. And so they came up with System 3 and then later System 5, which were efforts to kind of consolidate some of this development work and come up with one uh, unified stream. Um, so, of course, the other thing that happens with uh, the, the commercialization of Unix is other vendors now start to license the code and start to develop their own commercial versions. And we start moving from a more um, source code based distribution to binary only distributions. And uh, AT&T becomes much more protective of the source code, code and who they will license it to. 
So in response to that, of course, you get uh, competing efforts. So we start to see clones or variants of Unix. And uh, notable in, in that is Richard Stallman uh, starts a very ambitious project called the GNU Project. Uh, GNU standing for GNU is not Unix. And the idea was to piece by piece develop uh, open source versions of everything that was in Unix and a bunch more stuff that he was interested in. Um, the kernel didn't come about until much later and is still kind of more abundant at this stage. Um, but anyway, uh, we all know about GNU. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of stuff there that, uh, that uh, was uh, uh, exploited by other um, systems, of course, to, to enrich their tool set. The other thing that happened is um, uh, Andrew Tannenbaum, uh, an academic who was interested in operating systems research, uh, developed uh, something he called Minix, which was a very minimal kernel type of Unix system. So the idea was to, to um, emulate the Unix environment, but in a, a different kernel design that, that sort of fit the, the things he, he wanted to promote uh, about kernel design, things like, uh, well, it was a microkernel, and uh, the idea of moving out of the kernel and into user space just about everything other than the very critical stuff you needed. Um, and as I said, there was also a lot of commercial development. So we started to see mainframe Unix, both from IBM and from Amdahl. Uh, and we started to see all the way down to the PC level, um, various types of Unix variants being developed. The other thing that happened um, in the 80s, uh, all of this development up until now was still based on the old TTY model. So it was very much a time-sharing system with text input and output uh, terminal type of interface. Um, but to get with the technology that was developing in the 80s, we really needed two other things, a GUI and network. And so um, some of the BSD developers, uh, Bill Joy being one of them, uh, decided to focus on that kind of development. And people within BSD also ended up doing another distribution for BSD that added all kinds of fancy stuff to the system, a new fast file system, sockets in the TCP stack, which then uh, spread to the rest of the Unix world. Um, and uh, parallel development to that was X-Window, which went uh, from a very first release in 1984 to five years later, uh, essentially what is more or less its current form. Um, since then, there have been a few minor releases to X11, but um, things were more or less in its final form by the end of the, the 80s. And of course, with all of this commercial development um, and these competing systems, uh, you ended up with part one of uh, what has been called the Unix Wars. And so that was mostly at the time um, AT&T's System 5 versus the BSD camp. Uh, so yeah, you had these this parallel development of these two systems going on with um, incompatible system calls, libraries, and uh, different standards for where uh, files are located. And so AT&T tried to um, work towards consolidating that with um, the System 5. Well, first, the System 5 interface definition was intended to make all the various commercial Unix systems try to follow one standard specification. And then eventually they worked um, with SCO and then with Sun to try and merge some of these other uh, different systems. And the result of that was System 5 um, uh, release 4. So just to give you an idea of how uh, much uh, forking of uh, um, uh, the various distributions of, of Unix was happening, I don't expect you to see that <laughs> or be able to read it from here, so I'll just pass around this printed version of the chart. Um, 
this is actually a st oversimplification of what really happened. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, with um, more commercial interest in Unix, we needed a competing user group. <laughs> so whereas um, uh, Usenix was primarily an academic focus, uh, slash user slash group uh, was started initially with a much more commercial focus, uh, an industry focus. They ended up changing their name later to Uniforum and continued to exist into um, the 2000s, but they just kind of fizzled out after that. And if you do a Google search for Uniforum now, you find a lot more false positives for other organizations named Uniform, and it's hard to actually find much about the, the uh, Uniform that used to be called User Group. Um, some of the best information I found on them was actually on the Usenix website. <laughs> but one of the things that did come out of there that was quite significant is they worked with uh, IEEE on the POSIX standards, which was one of the big efforts to try and consolidate and standardize what um, we consider Unix. Mm -hmm. Mug used to be an affiliate of one of the two groups, weren't we? Yeah, that gets me to my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, actually before there was a Mug, or uh, even a Tug, <laughs> the technical Unix user group, there was actually a, a user group Winnipeg. Um, that, that was the first Unix user group in Winnipeg that I'm aware of, and um, its focus was heavily on advocacy and marketing, and uh, unfortunately it was led by a couple very, shall we say, strong personalities who kind of rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. <laughs> and so attendance at their meetings quickly dwindled. And at one of the last meetings, I believe one of the last meetings of that group ever, um, there were three people in attendance. Actually, the two people who started the group were out of town at a conference. And so the roommate of one of them showed up just to let people in. Mm -hmm. Three people showed up. Me, my brother, and Susan Zook. I don't know if any of you remember Susan yeah, Zook, oh yeah. who was president of MUG at one point. Yeah. So the three of us were the only ones who showed up at that meeting. So we basically just sat and figured, okay, something's wrong with this group. We need to do things differently. So we, we hammered out uh, what we thought would be a better way to attract people. And so we started by conducting a Unix user survey and we mailed it out to all the Unix users we were aware of in Winnipeg at the time got um, maybe about 10% response, which is probably better than most surveys, but that was a very small number of responses. But based on that and based some of our own um, um, uh, gut hunches, we, we decided what we needed to do to get a group going. So we started very small and humbly, um, just by having monthly meetings. There was no formal structure to the group initially. Um, there was no formal membership. Uh, it was just get the word out there and just see who comes and try to gauge what the interests are and what the needs are of people and try to respond to that with uh, the presentations we would, would do. And I think to a great extent that's what we as a board still try to do um, to this day. So it was only a couple years after those first informal meetings that we actually bothered to do a name notation on the name Technical Unix User Group and started a little bit more formal structure with a monthly newsletter and a formal membership at $25 a year. <laughs> it's actually gone down since then. <laughs> and of course, the 80s um, was also... Oh yeah, I forgot to mention initially. <laughs> This is not only the 50th anniversary of Unix, it's the 50th anniversary of the Internet. Um, in October of uh, 1969 was the first test message between two computers in the prototype network that then became ARPANET, which then became the Internet. 
And it wasn't uh, too long before that that people were trying to break that network. <laughs> and some of you may remember the Morris worm from 1988. Yeah. So Robert Tappan Morris, uh, who was the son of Robert Morris Sr., who worked at Bell Labs on Unix, among other things, who also worked uh, uh, in cryptography at Bell Labs and then later was uh, hired by the NSA. And he was working at the NSA, in fact, at the time this broke. And so it was a bit of an embarrassment for, for uh, Robert Morris Sr. Anyway, this uh, exploited vulnerabilities that existed in Unix. Um, there wasn't a lot of concern for security at the time Unix was initially written, and a lot of uh, holes uh, existed in the early code, and no one had really bothered to do a careful code audit to try and close that up. And so Robert Morris had access to, Robert Morris Jr., that is, <laughs> had access to that source code and um, figured out ways he could exploit the system. And uh, he wrote a worm that exploited that. But they, because of a few miscalculations in the way he did things, it ended up really spinning out of control and caused a lot of damage and a lot more attention than he was uh, expecting. Uh, he did end up being convicted uh, a few years later. Um, he never did jail time, but there was a fairly substantial fine, and he had to do many hours of community service. He's since, oh yeah, I didn't mention it on the slides, but um, he did this uh, early in his master's level studies. I think it was at Princeton, I'm not sure. Uh, you can just click on the link, uh, it, it, his biography is there. But he had done his undergrad degree at MIT. And when he was doing his master's degree, he found out his MIT account was still active. So rather than compromise his current account, he launched the worm from MI his MIT account. And uh, turns out he's now a tenured prof. And in internet clickbait language, you'll never guess where. <laughs> uh, turns out, in this issue of Login that I'm giving away, there's an article or a paper that he's co-written. Um, and interestingly, it's on um, trying to develop a more secure uh, POSIX kernel uh, written in Go. Um, because a lot of those errors like buffer overruns and use after free errors that are still very common in code that's written today, let alone code that uh, where these bugs haven't been discovered yet. Um, so they're proposing doing it in a high level language to get around those problems. Um, uh, Robert Morris wasn't alone in the 80s, of course. There were other people trying to exploit the internet and, and vulnerabilities and weak security in Unix. And Cliff Stoll wrote about his experiences in capturing Marcus Hess. And uh, he wrote that in a fictionalized version of the story called The Cuckoo's Egg. So moving forward to the third decade, um, we now see a shift from open standards, which is what we were working towards in the 80s, to open source. Um, the GNU uh, project that Stallman started in the previous decade continued to make a lot of progress, at least in terms of uh, uh, toolkit development. And um, the 90s is also when Linus Torvalds wrote uh, Linux loosely based on Minix, although Andrew Tannenbaum would disagree. <laughs> he actually critiqued um, the, the Linux kernel quite severely. But um, anyway, um, I guess what's fair to say is, is Linus Torvalds used um, Minix as kind of the springboard uh, to get the uh, development of Linux underway. And we all know how that uh, developed since then. Uh, the other thing is that AT&T and Sun that had gotten together to, to work on System 5 Release 4 uh, formalized their relationship a little bit by forming Unix International, which was kind of a competitor to OSF. 
So I guess this is kind of Unix Wars part two, <laughs> on a smaller scale maybe. Um, and eventually those two merged and uh, the result of the merge was to abandon OSF1. And uh, one of the companies that had been quite heavily involved and invested in that was Digital. Sorry, it was... Somebody's voice recognition. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought someone was making a comment. Um, so yeah, uh, Digital didn't want to abandon their OSF1 efforts, so they just rebranded it as Digital Unix. But of course, this is also the decade where Digital was bought out by Compaq, and later on, Compaq gets bought out by um, HP. So, um, the other thing that happened, which uh, much to the chagrin of a lot of the uh, AT&T Bell Labs people who had developed uh, Unix, uh, AT&T sold the rights to <coughs> System 5 Release 4 uh, to Novell, which then spun it off. Um, and... Uh, Eventually, the trademark was transferred to one organization and the source code was transferred to another organization. MUG continued to uh, evolve during that time. We went from being called the Technical Unix User Group to being the Manitoba Unix User Group. Um, we also, through uh, uh, a bit of luck in a connection through Bill Reed, um, managed to get a uh, system called Mug Online, which gave us internet access through the university. And we were actually the first non-university um, uh, organization to have internet access in Winnipeg, possibly in all of Manitoba. Um, and we were allowed to give this to our members. The only question, or the only key was they, they had to be signed up members of the group. And so this caused a big balloon in our uh, interest in, in the group. Um, my memory has it that uh, membership soared to a peak of over 200. Um, Brad's figures uh, showed a number slightly smaller than that, but... That kind of, yeah. That's sort of my memory, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know that, that we were meeting at the St. Boniface Hospital Research Center at the yeah, time. And yeah, we had a, a, a lecture uh, theater that, that held like 250 people, and we were close to capacity in there. Mm -hmm. there, there was one uh, Unix Foundation uh, member who came to a lecture, and not Paul. And I was standing at the back, mm -hmm. fighting for a space. Okay. Uh, hmm. uh, there weren't 500. Oh, no, it couldn't have been 500. 500 would have been grossly illegal in that whole area. Okay. <laughs> it, it, was, it was absolutely yeah. screaming and uh, yeah. People were uh, mm -hmm. all the way down the stairs on, yep. the, on the floor. It was just totally packed. Yep. Mm -hmm. I remember that meeting. I think I do too. <laughs> I remember because I was helping with the AD that day. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing that happened with the group, in addition to uh, soaring membership for a, a brief while, was um, we collaborated with um, KIPS to do a couple conferences. So we ended up acquiring a fair bit of funds through that. Um, and so the decision was made from the, uh, the executive at the time that we really needed to formalize the structure of the group a little more. Uh, because we were now dealing with some serious money and dealing with more members and members that we didn't necessarily know as well as we used to. It wasn't the small group where everyone had, you know, been together for many years. So um, one summer we got together at the cottage of one of the executive members at Shoal Lake to hammer out what we jokingly referred to as the Shoal Lake Accord at the time, which became the Mug Bylaws, which still govern our, uh, our group's operation to this day, with only minor um, uh, revisions that we voted on. Uh, twice we've voted on amendments to the bylaws, yeah. Um, so yeah, we adopted the current structure with a board that is elected by the members, and then the board gets together and, and uh, uh, appoints the executive officers. Um, and uh, 
and we are guided by what is written in the bylaws, which can only be amended by a vote of the entire membership, or a quorum of the membership, I should say. So, of course, the 90s, um, there was a lot of development that happened. There was the dot-com bubble, and, um, oh yeah, there was this thing called Netscape, which then, uh, uh, or, uh, yeah, <laughs> Netscape led to, to uh, uh, breaking of, of the web in some interesting ways because of um, poorly designed uh, uh, features of HTTP 1.0. <laughs> And um, the dot-com bubble uh, severely strained the uh, DNS infrastructure at the time, which led to um, things changing that way. Um, people continued to find buffer overrun uh, exploits that they could take advantage of, and um, people found all kinds of other interesting ways to try and break the internet. Uh, one of the notorious names from uh, the 90s was Kevin Mitnick, who actually did do jail time. Um, the other interesting thing is towards the end of that decade, um, the ISC proposed the use of DNSSEC um, to get around some of the severe restrictions in DNS um, that would lead to uh, potential abuse. So take a note of that date, 1998. Moving forward another decade, um, we move from kind of uh, some elation at all the development that's going on with Unix to some severe um, cons uh, consolidation and constraint. Um, this is kind of the, the dot-com bubble bust and a lot of companies are now being acquired and merging and uh, being shut down because of competition. So, um, yeah, we see um, the SCO group, or rather SCO, the company that now had the uh, um, Unix source code, uh, they sell it off to a company called Caldera, which then renames itself the SCO group. <laughs> and the SCO group then turns around and sues uh, Novell, IBM, and others. Mm -hmm. Actually, I need to point out a correction there. Okay. The original SCO sues yeah. Novell, IBM, and others. The oh. newly rebranded Caldera is not involved in the lawsuits at all. No, okay. So group, Skull Group is is the, is the canopy group yeah. company that, that became Caldera. Right. Spin-offs, yeah. and it's it's the one that launched the lawsuit when its failing Linux business changed itself from mm -hmm. Caldera to Skull Group. Failing Linux business. The original Santa Cruz operation. Yeah. It sold. It sold those. Yeah. yeah. Assets. My memory on this was, was failing too. Like I, I thought it was SCO, the original company that, that had launched the lawsuits. But what I read online suggested this yeah, was right. the sequence of events. Anyway, those uh, lawsuits dragged out for many years. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it all eventually. Well, the last one was dismissed in 2016, <laughs> so it took uh, uh, 13 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, HP then bought out Compaq, and so that was kind of the end of um, uh, digital Unix or True 64, as it was called at that point. Um, Sun continues uh, going gangbusters for a few years more, um, releasing Open Solaris, all kinds of interesting kernel development uh, in the middle of the decade. Um, they then buy out MySQL uh, in 2008 um, with their plan to compete head-on with Oracle and with IBM. <laughs> Rumors started soon thereafter that IBM was actually looking to buy them, but um, that didn't happen. But Oracle did actually make moves to buy them out um, the very next year. Uh, and that took another year or two to uh, actually settle through the courts. 
So at this point, um, there's not a lot of commercial Unix left. There's Mac OS, there's Solaris, HPUX, and AIX remain as kind of viable players in the market. Um, in open source, Unix, uh, Linux kind of dominates, although there are other um, open source uh, alternatives. And of course, it's the decade where we almost broke the internet for the third time. <laughs> um, remember the thing I'd said about DNSSEC in 90, I think it was 98? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so a full decade after that, uh, Dan Kaminsky uh, discovers a serious flaw in uh, DNS. That particular flaw was a special case of a more general vulnerability in uh, UDP-based protocols that Dan Bernstein had pointed out five years prior to that. <laughs> um, and it dealt with uh, port randomization or the lack thereof um, and uh, the way that that could be exploited. So uh, Kaminsky uh, holds a press conference. There's uh, essentially a moratorium on releasing the details of that until all the players involved who've been notified can get their source code out. But of course, once you announce this, there's bound to be leaks, and that's exactly what happened. So then everyone was scrambling to get their patches out hastily, and what we ended up with was a bunch of hastily released patches to uh, DNS so that we could continue to hobble along and continue to ignore what had been recommended a decade earlier about switching to DNSSEC. And finally, we get to our current decade, which is about to come to a close. And here's where um, uh, things continue to evolve in a slightly different direction. Um, I don't know if obscurity is the right term for it, because Unix was already you know, fairly well known, and there were particular um, words in the Unix lexicon that actually had gotten into the OED, like grep. <laughs> um, but uh, to the general public, um, Unix was not really a known quantity. But we quickly get from uh, that point of it being kind of an obscure thing that is mostly in server rooms to being literally everywhere. Um, and depending on how generous you're going to be in your definition of what constitutes Unix, um, your iOS devices and your, um, your um, uh, Android devices, uh, they've got Unix-like kernels in them, albeit severely restricted. But <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, Unix is now... Unix or some form of Unix is running in just about everything. Um, this is also the decade where HP commits to supporting Linux as an alternative to their HP UX. And um, of course, with the acquisition of Sun by Oracle, um, Oracle does continue uh, to work on Solaris to some extent. They drop open Solaris, of course, because Oracle. <laughs> um, but Unix, or sorry, um, Oracle also does continue to hedge their bets by uh, supporting their particular version of uh, Linux. So, and then later in the decade, we see that Microsoft develops Windows subsystem for Linux, which at first is really just kind of an emulation layer for the Linux API. But now with the version they're working on, uh, WSL2, it's kind of a full-fledged Linux kernel in there. So it looks like pretty much every player that had an alternative uh, is now hedging their bets with some sort of skin in the game uh, with Linux. Um, and we see Linux going into um, pretty much every kind of computer out there, including a lot of embedded devices. Uh, Raspberry Pi uh, starts to uh, uh, become a viable entity early in the decade, and uh, that popularizes uh, Linux to a whole other audience. 
and uh, to a whole other segment of the market, um, although there were other embedded Linuxes before that. Um, and uh, Toyota quite recently adopts the automotive grade Linux for their stuff. So we're seeing Linux into cars. And if any of you were at the... Tesla uh, use it too. Uh, quite possible, you know. Yeah, there, there are other, other companies other than Toyota are doing it. But well, is QNX still, uh, still a player? Yep. They're, they're, yeah. Yeah. They're still yep. Mm -hmm. Free large houses also. Yeah. QNX mm -hmm. is a fair size player in the better places. QNX is a QNX. Used to be, but yeah. not so much. Yeah. 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 It's mostly automotive for QNX. Automotive. Yeah, yes. yeah, and towards the end of the decade, also, IBM buys out Red Hat. Um, now, IBM had already made a significant commitment towards uh, Linux as an alternative to their AIX, but this kind of solidifies that position. So, yeah, we, we now see every player uh, in the operating system game um, is hedging their bets uh, against their proprietary uh, products with some sort of uh, commitment to Linux. <clears throat> and of course, with all of this uh, embedded technology and IoT and all of that, here's where we broke the internet yet again. <laughs> this time almost completely, but uh, somehow we managed to still survive. Um, so yeah, the first few uh, years of uh, this decade were pretty quiet on that front, I think. I mean, there were the usual CVEs being reported on a fairly uh, steady basis, but uh, 2014 is kind of when all hell broke loose with Heartbleed, Poodle, and at least six other vulnerabilities uh, with CVE uh, codes attached to them being discovered just in OpenSSL. <laughs> and this led uh, Theo Durad to, uh, to uh, uh, make the statement that it has since been quoted quite often about OpenSSL is not developed by a responsible team. <laughs> and led to him forking uh, uh, free SSL? Libre, so, SSL. Libre SSL, right. Um, that same year is also when Shellshock uh, broke, and that was actually a vulnerability in Bash that existed since the 90s, because someone back then thought it would be a good idea to uh, be able to store um, uh, shell functions in the environment. Okay, maybe the idea had some merit if it had been implemented in a particular way, like maybe store them all in one specific environment variable, or use a common prefix. No, what they did was basically let you store them anywhere in the environment, and Bash would scan the environment, and anything that looked like a function definition in the environment, it would go ahead and execute it. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> and uh, that was also um, uh, the decade where we found more uh, stack, uh, stack buffer overflow vulnerabilities, uh, more use after free vulnerabilities, um, but also vulnerabilities at all kinds of other levels, vulnerabilities in the uh, virtual machine support, vulnerabilities down at the lowest levels of hardware, um, basically RAM architecture, finding ways to exploit that. Um, kernel uh, vulnerabilities, um, more hardware vulnerabilities, Meltdown and Spectre, we've all heard about those things. Um, and of course, a whole cache of hacking tools um, being leaked <laughs> from the CIA through WikiLeaks. Um, so yeah, uh, all of this could lead us to believe that we're just um, dealing with a whole mess of very badly written code that, uh, that just can't be trusted. Or also yeah. looking at <laughs> what, what have we wrought upon ourselves with these um, deeply nested stacks a very complex code that no one really fully understands and vulnerabilities up and down the stack uh, at all levels. We're relying more and more on code that uh, other people have written that we 
can't vouch for. We don't, uh, we don't know. And we're actually depending more and more on this stuff all the time. And in most cases, that we don't even know exists. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, what can we do about that? Mm. Let's just ponder that for a while. I'm just going to shift focuses a little bit. Because, um, yeah, speaking of complexity, uh, part of it is just a natural outcropping of what's happened in the hardware industry. We've gone from, in these five decades, uh, the very humble, simple architecture of the very first version of Unix uh, with its uh, 8K words of memory and one megabyte of storage um, to... Uh, okay, so, so that's just kind of our, our, our template that we're comparing by. Um, for the next... Uh, at the end of each of the following decades, what I'm showing you is the configuration that I've been using um, in, in my work at the university. Uh, and this is basically what we've been using as like a work group server type of configuration. And so you can see comparatively what's been going on in terms of uh, uh, scale of things. Um, word length, basically about every 20 years, we've been uh, doubling the word length. I don't think that trend's going to continue, just like we're not going to continue with um, uh, clock speeds. I didn't bother with putting clock speeds on this chart because I couldn't find it for all of these things. Uh, but what you can see happening with RAM is we're going up by almost an order of magnitude per decade. And uh, storage is going up even faster than that. Uh, just, yeah, a ridiculous amount of storage compared to what we were dealing with before. And in each of these cases, this is not the state of the art at the end of these decades. This is just what we happen to be running at a work group level within our department. Um, yeah. And I mentioned the Raspberry Pi earlier. It's interesting to see in the short number of years that it's been out, uh, how things have developed with no increase in cost, and in some cases even a decrease in cost. And the other interesting thing to point out about this is how the typical configuration of a $35 Raspberry Pi is roughly equivalent to the server architecture that was kind of the norm for about a decade previous, or a workstation configuration that was the norm about half a decade to a decade previous. So that's a lot of computing power available in a very small, very inexpensive package. And so, you know, the, the, the lure is, is there, obviously, and, uh, and yeah, there's, there's reasons that we're, we're going to, to, to more complex stuff. It's, it's, it's hard to, to avoid it when it's, it's available so, so cheaply. Um, the other interesting thing about the Raspberry Pi, um, it's not the only single board computer in that price range or of that level of performance that runs Linux or some form of Unix. Um, I think the thing that I find special about the Raspberry Pi is it's not just the hardware, but it's the software that goes along with it and the community. And so it's kind of a, a, a small encapsulation of what's been happening with the Unix industry as a whole. Rob Pike is quoted as saying, one of the best features of Unix is community. And one of the worst features of Unix is there are so many communities to choose from. <laughs> but one more thing about the Raspberry Pi, just to wrap things up and bring us back to where we started. <laughs> yeah, with that little $35 single board computer, even like the initial Raspberry Pi, not, not the Raspberry Pi 4 or anything, you could run, run this on a $10 Pi Zero if you wanted to you have enough horsepower to reasonably emulate a full PDP-11 architecture and probably even exceed its performance. <laughs> um, and so, of course, when I read about this, um, 
I, I didn't bother buying the panel of blinking lights, but you can actually have your very own for about $250 US. <laughs> But the software behind it is an emulator called SimH, which is freely available. You can just install the package on your Raspberry Pi. And from another site, you can get uh, an image of the version 7 distribution tape, which is available freely through, again, the Unix Heritage Society. And so you can unzip that tape image. You can start up your PDP emulator. You can boot the tape and you can install it on your emulated hard drive. And so I thought, I have to do this. And I'm doing it on a Raspberry Pi where I've got a fairly humble, what I think is a humble SD card. And I'm thinking, do I have enough space free on this thing? <laughs> and then I realized, oh yeah, I'm thinking gigabytes. And what I needed was two and a half megabytes. <laughs> so yeah, I had enough space. <laughs> So yeah, I invite you to, to try this out if, if you want to really live the, the, the nostalgia of uh, V7 Unix. And uh, as I say in the, the, uh, the tagline at the top, emulation really is the cure for nostalgia because as soon as I started playing around with that, I realized how crude and primitive it was and how many of the features that I've come to rely on in Unix weren't even in V7 Unix yet. You know, things like uh, uh, any kind of command history, let alone command line editing and uh, all of that kind of stuff. Um, there wasn't even a pager. There was no more, no PG, no less, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That was your so. pager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was great fun to try it out. I invite you to try it. The, the link to a uh, full tutorial is at the bottom. But um, uh, pay attention to the uh, location I provide here because they've actually restructured things. And so the link in this tutorial to get the uh, distribution tape is actually broken. So. Um, yeah, have fun, play with it. But uh, in closing, um, where do we go from here? <laughs> I talked about the complexity. I talked about all the security vulnerabilities. Before um, talking about how we move forward, I think it's important to look back at what uh, got us there initially and what were really the, the features that made Unix what it is and uh, what we uh, liked about it. So things um, that uh, I thought of as important from some of the sources I read, um, portability and vendor independence are, are what really were a game changer um, for operating systems. Um, and uh, it really led to, to a lot of changes in a lot of volatility, actually, in the, the hardware industry and uh, in the software industry as well. Um, it, it was really a game changer. Um, having open standards, of course, is important. And having some sort of access to the source code was hugely important to, to uh, um, the development of Unix. Um, it wasn't all done at Bell Labs. The, it was really a, a very distributed effort by a lot of people um, working in a lot of different locations. And of course, a lot of that development now is, is open source. But at the time, it wasn't open source, but at least you had access to source code, which was, um, again, a game changer at the time. Uh, the scalability of the system, that you can have the same software running on everything from a single board computer all the way to a big mainframe. Um, the file system, the idea that everything is treated as a file, uh, and a file is just an unformatted stream of bytes, be that text or some other um, data format. Um, people mention pipes. That came in, I think, in version 3. Um, uh, Ken Thompson uh, is the one who implemented it, but the concept wasn't his. Doug McElroy actually had written about pipes and had proposed it as far back as 1964. 
Um, and his concept initially was to have like a mesh network of interconnected processes that would all communicate with each other. Um, and he actually was kind of browbeating <laughs> Ken Thompson to put this into Unix uh, from the beginning. And Ken Thompson resisted for a long time. Uh, and finally, one evening, he decided the full concept that Doug McElroy wanted just is too problematic. There's too many possibilities for deadlocks or starvation, and it would just be a nightmare to implement. But what he saw as potentially useful is just a simple linear um, sequence of, uh, of, of pipes, what he called the pipeline. And so he implemented the pipe primitive in the, the kernel in one evening, and then um, started to, to experiment with a few of the existing utilities. And uh, in one of the uh, interviews, uh, he described it as uh, the, a feeding frenzy like piranhas being released on a, <laughs> an animal in, in water. And uh, so, yeah, as soon as uh, this was implemented, it caused this feeding frenzy uh, within Bell Labs. And suddenly people were trying all kinds of combinations of utilities that people wouldn't have even thought to put together before. But they, they realized, okay, we have to do this and this. And they then started to rewrite a bunch of the tools to make them more usable as filters. And so the whole idea of pipelines and filters, which we see now as being one of the core concepts of Unix. Um, it was actually um, finally just because Ken, uh, uh, Ken Thompson uh, broke down and, and finally implemented a subset of what Doug McElroy had been asking for since 1964. <laughs> so um, I'm going to leave one of the last words uh, for this talk to uh, Doug McElroy that I just mentioned. Actually, this is a paraphrase. This is a shorter version of what he actually had stated. But uh, the Unix philosophy can be summed up as write programs that do one thing and do it well. Write programs to work together. Write programs to handle text streams because that is a universal interface. So Unix has been about simplicity, simple design, and then build your complexity out of simple building blocks, Lego style. Um, yeah. And I'm just going to leave you with one last little message, which is kind of ironic now, <laughs> given who was promoting this. Any questions? Uh, just one quick one. Mm -hmm. You said at the very beginning, or close to the beginning, that there was a video of, of one of those guys talking about the hard yeah. drive. Do you have a link to that? Um, if I don't already have it in, I'll put it in. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and this will be up on the, the MUG website. Uh, I'll, I'll link it in tomorrow into the, the, the meeting webpage. Mm -hmm. Yep. One other memory in relationship to this is that the approval of Apollo Moonland also took place in 69. Mm -hmm. And uh, if um, Quirks and Quirks had it right, the, we understand that drivers driverless cars may be coming in. However, among the astronauts, they've already had that decision and they have absolutely refused it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. 1969 is also when Sesame Street took the world by storm and popularized an obscure Italian song called Menomina. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Omer. Okay. <laughs>